Since the last episode, I've come closer to tracking down the linguisa recipe. What started as a rumor whispered to me during my interviews has become more substantial. Someone who we'll hear from in the next episode has a local connection in San Leandro. His connection is a man who knows everyone's secrets. The classic confidant, the keeper of people's innermost thoughts and desires, the reluctant therapist for decades. He's a barber, of course. And he knows the man who still has the recipe, safely locked away for more than two decades. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Back to the story. That sausage was Stewart's family's legacy, and despite the remarkable product, he was already running into issues, as we learned last episode. Instead of working with the USDA inspectors that were asking him to make changes, Stewart dug his heels in. His dad was no longer around to fix things. So Stewart ran to other figures of authority to handle his problems. Local government. He likely got the idea from his dad's role in the city, as one of the good old boys. From KCBS Radio and Odyssey, I'm Natalia Gravich, and this is The Sausage King. Episode 4. If you can't beat him, join him. Tweedy was a larger-than-life local businessman and shook hands with politicians daily. He knew all of them on a first-name basis. By the time Stewart had taken over his father's sausage-making business, he'd become well-known around town as well, as more of a character. Well, that's the nice way of putting it. Even before his fateful mayoral run in 1998, local San Leandro politicians were well aware of him, at first because of his father, and after that, because he earned his own notoriety. I'm Bob Glaze and uh, live here in San Leandro, former council member. I was council member from 1984 to 1992, and then 1996 through 2005. We know Bob. We've heard from him multiple times now. He's the council member who Googled San Leandro for me and showed me their Wikipedia page. He was not happy that Stuart Alexander is what his adopted city is best known for. Bob's originally from Oakland, but has lived in San Leandro since 1963. Bob is something of an institution in San Leandro. And he has a great memory. He remembers Stewart's father ingratiating himself with the local politicians back when he first started serving on the city council. I knew Tweedy um, simply because Tweedy was an institution too. And so if you did anything around the chamber or the business community, anything down Pelton Square, anything around there, uh, Tweedy was there. And um, it was funny because there was two gentlemen that uh, we used to always confuse their names because uh, uh, they both had the same type of stature. One's name, of course, Tweedy, and the other's name was Tiny. And clearly two different businessmen and like that, but uh, at the same time. But no, he was... He truly was somebody to walk around town, walk into a place, a um, restaurant or whatever. Everybody knew his name. Everybody knew who he was. Um, and I think, one, because he was unique in, in his stature and everything else, and, um, and he, was, he was friendly. But this friendly personality didn't seem to translate to his relationship with Stuart. Bob's recollection is different from others. Most people say that while father and son weren't close, their relationship wasn't all that unusual. But Bob tells a different story. A lot of reports during the um, during time that he was really hard on on Stewart. Um, People said it; they didn't think it was justified that he was yelling at him and everything else. Um, I'm not sure that that's true because he he was Stewart was. You know, what I knew of him before, and uh, and he would just show up to things and like that. Um, he was somebody that could get himself in trouble and and seemed to be the screw-up of of the family. And so it, it uh, 
wasn't unusual, I wouldn't think, for him to do it. Plus, his dad's main focus was on the business. And uh, how he built that reputation with uh, Linguisa and like that was that he was fanatical about how it was done. And when uh, um, Stuart would go in the summertime and like that, you know, he wouldn't follow all the rules. And that was one thing famous for Stuart is he didn't like authority. He didn't like, he really didn't like politicians, but he ran for council. He um, didn't like to fro- follow any rules, period. Many people have described Stuart this way, as someone who didn't think the rules applied to him. He had issues with authority. I kept asking everyone where he might have gotten this attitude from because his brothers could not have been more different. I thought perhaps that maybe he learned that from his father, but Bob seemed to think it was unlikely. Tweedy wasn't one to break the rules. No. um, I think he would bend them, but I don't think he was anywhere close to the extreme that Stuart was. And he he was generally a nice guy. When you'd meet him and you knew what he'd do, he'd tell you about his business, he'd tell you about, you know, things that he does. Um, He didn't give the outward appearance of being that way. Bob even witnessed some of these confrontations between father and son, during council meetings or at other events. I've heard him yell at him for doing something, and it usually was something stupid. You know, they'd be like, he'd show up to a chamber stuff with, with his dad or whatever, and Um, he'd be goofing around in the corner and his dad would get on him you know hey you know you're representing the business you know it was I'm not sure exactly his age at that time but it was probably about four or five years before uh, Tweety's death yeah he was an adult I mean he was and his dad was at the point where he was he was having him out to different things because he knew he was the heir apparent and so he wanted him to get used to the business. And I think that's what the majority of arguments that people would hear is about the business or about him acting crazy or stupid, you know, at something that he should be, you know, promoting the business. So, Even more troubling, he said, was the way Tweedy would essentially bail Stewart out of whatever trouble he'd gotten himself into. This was the prevailing assumption of most people I talked to. That is, I don't know personally, but that has been everybody's um, feeling that whenever he got in trouble, he would go bail him out. And according to Bob, at least in this respect, Stuart wasn't alone. This was the status quo at the time, especially for a group of kids around Stuart's age whose parents held clout in the community. We had businessmen in this city who had kids. And their kids were their worst nightmares. They were the, the, you know, they were the greatest businessmen and like that, but their kids always caused them the problems after all. And it's funny because it was like all the fathers during that time would just basically take care of the problem. And it, it was funny because we always, you know, the worst part about it is the kids were rotten. And the, and the parents, the fathers, the businessmen at that time, were some of the nicest guys you'd ever meet. He's the only, he's the only one that murdered somebody, but the others had gotten into some of the same type of altercations as he did with his neighbor. He would do it with, you know, get a run-in with the police, police department or whatever, and it would always be... You know, oh, dad is such a nice guy, and oh, he'll take care of it. And I'll, t- I'll send him to counseling, whatever it takes. And so that was kind of, during that time, that was kind of the, the M.O. for some of these guys. Regardless of the conflict between these fathers and sons, Bob, like most people, had nothing but respect for Tweety. And that's like some people. Some people, when they walk into a room, they have a presence about them. It's, it's one of those phenomenons that you just kind of go, oh, yeah, okay, who is this guy? And that, that was Tweety. When Stewart took over this business, he sought not only to fill his father's shoes on the business side of things. Stewart wanted to fill his father's shoes with the movers and shakers in the community, too. 
he assumed the role under his self-dubbed title, The Sausage King, and expected others to respect him the same way they respected his father. And when things didn't go his way, he didn't take it well. The problem was that he would show up to council meetings and um, because he would have, he had run-ins with uh, building inspectors, police department, anybody of authority, he would get in and run in, and then he would come and he would come to city council and say, I'm being uh, persecuted by the police department or the building inspectors. The main issue cropped up when Stewart tried to start another business in the city and ran into problems right off the bat. He tried to, he did additions to a building that he didn't get building permits for. Of course, the inspectors, you go right by the building, they go in and say, hey, you know, what are you doing? He, w- he was trying to open up a restaurant without any permits uh, because he just thought he could. It became a soup kitchen. And, yeah, and, and it's, the, it's the damnedest thing about it is because it was, he was trying to make, he was going to start uh, making Santos Linguisa and make it... Um, part of a restaurant and he'd be serving linguisa and and the steaks and everything else and so he started doing all this remodeling and everything and figuring he's going to just open up a restaurant he doesn't have to ask uh, public health anybody well he would come to the council and oh i'm being persecuted and everything else and and we get kind of briefs on oh this is what he's doing and, and like that as a workaround stewart came up with a poorly thought out plan to get his project off the ground and when it got to the point where we were truly were thinking it's got to stop and we need to enforce it, he turned around and there was a uh, uh, a lady in uh, Oakland called Mother Wright. He's talking about Mary Ann Wright. She was a humanitarian activist who lived and worked in Oakland and became a beacon for feeding those less fortunate. She passed away in 2009 at age 88. During the week, she would do a soup kitchen and she would distribute uh, uh, meals to the homeless and everything else. But she had no real kitchen or anything else for it. She did a lot of it at her house or some of her volunteers. And so Stuart got a hold of her and says, oh, hey, here's a place for a soup kitchen for you. And he put a sign out there, Mother Wright's Kitchen and everything else, figuring enforcement's going to end because they're not going to go under after Mother Wright. Mother Wright actually wound up testifying at Stewart's defense at his trial. But more on that later. The soup kitchen never did get off the ground, mainly due to Stewart's insistence on skirting around the red tape. Our inspectors went in and talked to her and told her, you know, this isn't, this isn't going to make it and like that. And we, we'll allow you to do certain things, but what he was envisioning, not going to happen. And it was right around this time that Stewart announced his intentions to run for mayor of San Leandro in the 1998 election. He started to become a fixture. And usually when they start to become a fixture, you go, oh, this one's running for mayor, this one's running. I thought he would run for council or something, but he, he was mayor. We will, beginning, we will begin, beginning the opening statements with Stuart Alexander, who has four minutes. My name is Stuart Alexander. I'm proud owner of Santos Linguisa Factory that's been in San Leandro for over 75 years, spanning three generations. You know why I'm the youngest candidate for mayor? Because I care and I'm proud about my city and I don't want to sit around and see it deteriorating and seeing my fellow business owners moving out. This is from actual footage from the campaign. It was a televised event hosted by San Leandro's League of Women Voters. I was lucky enough to be given a copy by one of the candidates running against Stewart, Sheila Young, who wound up winning and serving as the city's mayor. The footage is exactly what you'd expect from that time. The lighting is harsh and bright. Each of the four candidates is sitting on a white stuffed chair on an elevated gray stage, a dark blue screen as the backdrop. Everyone is wearing a combination of gray and black clothing. This is my first time seeing or hearing Stewart on film. He is not what I was expecting. His voice is more nasal than I'd originally thought. My name is Stewart Alexander. I'm proud owner of Santos Linguisa Factory 
that's been in San Leandro for over 75 years, spanning three generations. You know why I'm And he looks like David Arquette from the first movie of the Scream franchise. He also has a pronounced facial tick, which so far in my interviewing process, no one had mentioned. Every few words, it looks like he takes an extra hard blink, sort of squeezing his eyes shut. When I followed up with people who knew Stuart from a young age, they said it's likely due to him being dropped on his head when he was a baby, and the twitch became more pronounced when he was stressed. All in all, not someone you'd expect to command much authority or someone capable of the fear and intimidation he'd become so well known for. He looks more like the bullied, not so much the bully. But we all know looks can be deceiving. Why I'd become a good mayor is because I know where to focus. We must focus on a senior center in town. We must focus on building up our marina. And we must also focus on the things citizens need. I ask for you to vote for me because I've lived in San Leandro all my life and I care. I care about the direction it's going. And I want to sit around and watch things happen. I want to join with you and make things happen. Um, That's all I have to say. Okay. That was Stuart Alexander with his opening statement. But to those on the city council, it seemed obvious that Stuart's quest for mayor was most likely a ploy to get the authority he craved. To get government away from him. You know, his, his impression was if you were in power, um, because he felt that the mayor of the city basically would, you know, li- like his dad, had more influence than anybody else, and they could actually, if an inspector was coming to his business and was saying, you can't do that, the mayor could say, no, go away, you can't do that. So his impression on government was a little flawed, and I think he thought that he could do more than he actually could, which is usually the same attitude is those that that have that flawed attitude that get elected all of a sudden go, oh my God, what do you mean I can't do this? I'm a council member. I'm the mayor. And the difference would be is that when he would get in an argument with somebody, if they would push his button, he would explode. The city council members who were already familiar with him were worried that Stewart's temper would get the better of him in the campaign, especially as he zeroed in on his main opponent and the eventual winner, Sheila Young. And we had actually told Sheila a couple times is, don't push his button too far. And it was funny because I think after the incident happened with her, I mean with uh, the Guisa factory, is that... I think she really worried that that could have been her. And, or it could have been some of our inspectors. Or it's, it's how far you want to push it. And uh, we, had, we had a couple times, we had had some, um, some meetings where we actually asked the police department, you know, police officers sit in the back of the room because you didn't know what the next event was going to be. Sheila was used to dealing with crazy people. She'd previously worked as a paralegal in Oakland and was already serving on San Leandro City Council for a couple of years before running for mayor. Most of Stewart's antics didn't face her. I first met Sheila at Gordon Galvin's house. You remember Gordon. He's made appearances in a few episodes now. He was the former city council member who grew up with Stewart. He's the one Stewart tried to beat up. Gordon's house is on the tail end of a long dead-end street. By the time I arrived, Sheila and Gordon were deep in conversation, fiddling with a television remote. The campaign footage was on the television screen in what I could only describe as a family room. The television loomed over the three of us sitting on the couch, Stuart's face staring back at us. Sheila Young, um, I've lived in San Leandro for 40 years. Um, I was on the San Leandro City Council for a couple of years. And then I was mayor for almost nine years. We changed our voting schedule, so I ended up getting a little extra time. Bob vividly remembers the days when Stewart showed up to city council meetings, but he didn't make as much of an impression on Sheila. 
I don't remember Stuart coming to I council meetings so it would at have been. the time. He may have come to meetings after I won the mayor's race, but he never, he didn't come, he didn't come to the, he, he didn't have any qualms with me. I mean, we didn't have any words, although during the campaign, uh, he used to, he used to drive one of his trucks with uh, straw in the back end and with a pig. And he would park the truck with the pig and the straw in front of my campaign headquarters. <laughs> and and big signs on the side that said, Stuart Alexander for mayor. I don't know. I don't think there was any connection between the he pig and pigs. me. He just, he had a lot of pigs. <laughs> I, you know, I never thought about it in that regard. I never would have connected the dots between him maybe calling me a pig. I, I don't think that was ever his yeah, intent. Was he wasn't intent. mean like that with his words. He never used any no. words at me, toward me, about me that I knew about. Um, we were just opposites in a campaign for mayor. Besides the pig, which apparently was one of two pigs that Stewart kept as pets, Sheila maintained that things were relatively civil between them during the campaign. Well, but Stewart was always just a little off the rails, as Gordon has amply explained. And some of what he explained to you, I've actually never heard before. Uh, and it's been, it's been 25 years. So um, I don't remember any uh, altercations with Stewart verbally or any other way. He didn't have a dog in my fight. I mean, it was just, uh, we were not enemies. We were not friends. We just were acquaintances. I mean, everybody knew about Stuart Alexander. It was like, oh, yeah, Stuart. You know, because he did have a a small tick when he spoke. Well, you, you, and, could, you, you see, could it, see yeah. it in the video. Uh, but we were never close. It was all about uh, the city and not being fair to the small businessman and uh, not giving him. Op, you know, opportunities for permits and just wanting money, 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 money. And that's probably still true today. Yeah. <laughs> People still get angry that the city needs money, but that's how they operate on taxes. So it was almost kind of like a Trumpian, you know, he was Trump. He was Trump before, before Trump, Trump was Trump. Right? Right. Yeah, right. He was, you know. Well, not, maybe not as, maybe not as uh, damaging as, but, <laughs> yeah. but we, we did, we did Trump, speak uh, to uh, all of the local homeowner associations. We had big events at the Marina Community Center, and we'd all be on stage. He came to all of them, and whatever he says in this video with the legal women voters is exactly what he said the entire, the entire time. At first, Stewart's chances weren't too bad. He had a lot of support from the city's Portuguese community who still remembered and respected the legacy that Stewart's father had left behind. A couple of Portuguese community leaders threw their weight behind him in the beginning, according to Sheila. Maria and Laverne were supportive of Stewart at the time. Yeah, they were. They, uh, because they, they were old-time uh, Portuguese San Leandro, which, of course, San Leandro was mostly Portuguese at once upon a time. And um, they were all from that era with right. Tweedy, I think. They all knew Tweedy. Yeah. That's, he got a lot of support from that group of people. Right, and the, and the linguisa was a big deal. Yes. Maria and Laverne always had that at all their parties. Mm -hmm. But she soon came to uh, move her affection in a different direction <laughs> when he didn't win the election. Um, but, you know, there wasn't really... It was an interesting campaign. There were... There were two people in the campaign who were just a little off-center. One was Stewart and the other was Lou Filipovich, who was extremely well-known and was at every council meeting. And I could, I could give you lots of stories about Lou. Uh, but then the other person on the... We were just talking about this. Of the four people who ran in that campaign, I'm the only one who's still alive. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> the other three have passed away. And anyway... So other than other than the the pig in the back of the truck, which I will never ever forget because he left it there for days, almost every day. He would drive it away at night, take the pig home, feed it, bring it back, and it would <laughs> snort out in the. <laughs> I never went close enough to That's see if it was the same one. Right there. Yeah. Stewart's campaign was focused on promoting small businesses and lessening government regulation. 
Both Sheila and Gordon remembered this, and it was clear in the campaign video as well. How will you as a, count, as a mayor help council members to reach consensus on controversial issues? The question gets at your team building skills, your ability to listen to the community and to listen to your colleagues. And we'll start with you, Stuart Alexander. Well, my expertise is knowing from kids to seniors what their needs are and also dealing with other businesses throughout my business life is coming to a common agreement with each council member to benefit the residents of San Leandro without costing them taxpayers' money. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. That was the answer of Stuart Alexander. This makes sense. Stuart had already started having conflict with his factory by then. He started feeling the government inspectors were overstepping their bounds and threatening the way of life of small business owners like himself. In a way, him running for mayor was a roundabout way for him to try to shake the grip they seemed to have on his operation. But it didn't work. Most people I've interviewed point to one incident in particular as the final nail in the coffin for his campaign, the beating incident of his neighbor, Clifford Berg. I've mentioned this before. Stewart hauled trash as a side business and sometimes he dumped the garbage in the yard of one of his properties instead of taking it to be properly disposed. Berg was 75 in 1996 and had grown fed up with the situation. After Stewart caught him taking photos, he beat him up, accusing him of spying. Stewart was never charged in the attack and reportedly paid Berg $10,000 to forget it. But the incident became public knowledge while the campaign was underway. Stewart never recovered. After Sheila won, she didn't give Stewart a second thought. That is, until he took the lives of three state and federal meat inspectors during her term as mayor. And it fell to her to address the tragedy. I can't remember what I, all that I saw. I know that I was, I was mayor at the time mm-hmm. when it happened. And uh, I, of course, like everybody else, was shocked to something like that would happen in San Leandro because we we never had an outright murder. I mean, I, I think our first murder in our in our entire city, you know, Oakland would have like a hundred and we have like zero. Just, you know, one it got half a block away. Attention. Like it was on Oh clearly. You know, ABC, you know, you know. Well sure, because they were federal agents. It was it was very it was devastating at the time. Um of course, from my point of view, as a as a new young mayor, and I was young at the younger at the mm-hmm. time, um, I knew that I would be faced with having to speak in public. So that was well. I, I don't remember now what I said, but I know we worked very closely with our PIO. So that event, along with the death of a San Leandro police officer, were the two major events that defined Sheila's nine years as mayor. But she doesn't give herself enough credit. Her election marked a definite turning point in the city. The San Leandro Stewart had known in his youth was quickly changing. And then, of course, halfway through my first, well, halfway through my almost nine years, um, social media started to become more important and everybody had cell phones and things really started to change. And the old guard was sort of put on notice. As Stewart's version of San Leandro was disappearing, Stewart's business was too. In the late 90s, as he began butting heads with inspectors, they made multiple visits to his business. The changes he needed to make were clear, but true to form, he was against listening to authority. The result would be catastrophic. In the next episode, we will finally learn what exactly happened that fateful day at Stewart's factory and what the inspectors had been doing in the time leading up to their fatal attack. Despite knowing Stewart was a hothead, they had a duty, felt so strongly, that they walked into an unsafe situation and lost their lives. You have to remember, we deal with food safety, so we can't just let things go. So we can't just let things go. So sometimes we do have to do those multiple visits, but sometimes you just can't predict when someone's going to act so unpredictable. (laughs) The Sausage King is researched, written, and narrated by me, Natalia Gravich. Matt Pittman, Don Bastida, and Eric Brooks are our producers. 
with production, sound design, and editing by Matt Pittman. Cover art created by Dre Irabaran. Social media by Greg Wong. Jennifer Selig is brand manager for KCBS Radio. The Sausage King is a production of Odyssey. Listen and subscribe on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts.